I've been playing around with various frameworks for at least the past eight years. Um, but all these frameworks, Foundation, Bootstrap, Blueprint, they've only really existed, at least for, for me, uh, to disguise the fact that CSS layout, until now, has been pretty much a hack. Um, float, or floats, were the best thing we had at the time. But they weren't designed for full page layout. They were designed for this, floating an image next to some text. And that's pretty much all they were meant to do. So because of this, faking a grid with floats requires careful calculations, setting margins, uh, lots of debugging in different browsers. And it results in pages that easily break when the content changes or when the content isn't what the designer originally uh, or developer uh, expected. And the frameworks that we've many of us have probably been using hid away a lot of this complexity. A few years ago, it seemed like Flexbox was going to change all this. Uh, and in some ways, it did. Now, suddenly, we could put elements side by side, make them equal height, without resorting to hard-coded heights or JavaScript. So that was nice. We could also easily do this without any trickery or JavaScript. We could even wrap things on multiple rows. But using Flexbox to build a grid in two dimensions is also a hack. So then those frameworks we were using just transitioned to Flexbox. And we had CSS frameworks with Flexbox. Foundation moved to Flexbox. Bootstrap, I believe, also moved to using Flexbox. So there were better frameworks because of Flexbox, but it was still a hack. So how is CSS Grid different? CSS Grid had just appeared in the past year, uh, and it's been implemented at an astonishing speed. I, CSS Grid as a topic is far too large for me to go through. Uh, I can't go through all of it, but I'm going to go through the basics and then a few examples and then talk about what that means, in my opinion, for the future. So let's have a look at a simple example using the traditional 12-column grid we've all been using. We've got three elements we want to place on the grid, four columns each. Now, using Flexbox, we do something like this. This is an example from uh, the foundation framework, but it could, could be from any framework, really. We're setting display flex on the parent element, grid x, in, in this example. Then we're setting some paddings on the individual cells. And then we've set a width. So if you look at the few bottom rows there, we're setting the width to 33.33%, and then subtracting the, the paddings. Now, let's do the same thing with grid. Now we're setting display grid on the parent item. OK, that's not that much different from Flexbox. But the big difference is that now we've defined, we're defining the grid itself. So if you look at the, uh, the class grid in, in this bit of CSS, we've got a new property there, grid template columns, which has an um, odd value, repeat 12, 1, fr. We'll go into what that is um, in the next slides. And then we are setting a grid gap. And then right at the bottom, uh, we are setting the um, small four class, which is really just I wanted to use the same markup as, as in the foundation example. We're setting that to span four columns. 
but the big difference is that now we're not calculating any width. We're just saying, I want this to be four columns wide. So let's look at how to define a grid in more detail. Grid template columns and its counterpart grid template rows allow you to define arbitrary tracks. W tracks is a track is a generic term for column or row, by the way. So here we're creating a 200 pixel wide column and another 800 pixel wide column. And these are obviously fixed width columns. Now this example changes the second column to a flexible width. CSS Grid introduces a new FR unit, which means fraction of the available space. So in this case, the grid algorithm in the browser reserves 200 pixels for the first column, and then it looks at the remaining space and says, OK, it says one fraction, and that's, we've only got one column left, so we're going to give all that rest of all the space that's left to, to the second column. And the cool thing about the fraction unit is that we can just add a second column like this, which is also one FR, because now we have um, two columns that need to split the, the available space. So first, the browser is calculating one plus one, and then dividing that into two, and then splitting it up for the equally to the two columns. So if I were to change the second column to 2FR, now it's twice the size as the, uh, than the third column. Now back to my original example. If I want a 12-column grid, I could say grid template columns 1FR, 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 and so on. But there's a really handy repeat notation to do that in much shorter amount of code. Now, in this example, I've on, I'm only repeating one column, but I also could be repeating a pattern of columns. So I could have repeat 12, 1 FR, 50 pixels, for example. And then you have every other column would be one fraction of what was available. And then uh, every other column would be a fixed, fixed 50 pixels. And like I said, it has a counterpart grid template rows, which works exactly the same. So here I'm creating a 200 pixel header row, and then the rest is uh, allocated to whatever the content needs uh, as a minimum. There's also a max content keyword. And there's loads more of these keywords in CSS Grid, and I haven't got time to go through all of them, unfortunately. But it means we get a lot of flexibility in defining rows and columns. Now, we also don't need to set margins or paddings to fake gutters anymore, because CSS Grid has its own property for this, grid gap. It's a shorthand property for grid row gap and grid column gap, which means you can define them separately if you want, want to have a different uh, gutter width between the, C the grid tracks for columns and rows. So the first one there is for rows, and the second one is for columns. In the spec, th this has already been changed to gap, which hopefully means that we might get this in Flexbox later on, but that hasn't happened yet. But you should still use grid gap, because current browsers still don't support the short notation, and browsers will probably be supporting the, uh, supporting the old version for a long time. So to recap, to, defy, to create a grid, we say display grid. Then we define our tracks with grid template columns or grid template rows, or both. And then if we want to, we can define a gap with grid gap. Now, OK, what we've done so far is nothing we couldn't do with fl Flexbox or floats. It's more robust, but we could still do it with older techniques. But what about this? With Flexbox or Display Float, we'd probably have to create more wrapper containers and maybe do some height calculations with JavaScript or then uh, 
set fixed heights and hope that the content doesn't break the layout. With grid, all we need to do is this. At the bottom there, I've set the, given the first cell a class big one, and said grid row span two. So I want this element to span two rows, and that's it. And now it magically takes up the height of those two rows, regardless of the content in those other rows. And at the top, I've also defined grid auto rows to 200 pixels. Uh, grid auto rows and grid auto columns is another CSS grid property that allows you to say, if, the, if we need to create additional rows or columns that weren't defined in my original definition, they should be this size. Because it's possible for the grid to overflow if we def we it might be that we've defined only one row, but then we set an element to span two rows, so the browser has to know what to do. So in this case, it looks, OK, uh, we want those rows to be 200 pixels. Well, that could be anything. It could be 10 EM, or it could be min content, uh, or something else. There are many ways to define a grid and to place things on a grid. Um, there's line-based notation, named lines, grid template areas, defining using named lines and referencing by area, and there's also auto placement, which we were using in our first example. Now, the most basic form is line-based. Um, so here I've got four items uh, placed onto a grid, and let's look at item number two, cell two, in more detail. So you can see from the image that I want that to go from line number seven to line number 13. And by the way, um, obviously, this is a 12-column grid, but th that means you have 13 lines. So we're not talking about the tracks themselves. We're talking about the lines in between. So to place an item into a a specific place on the grid, we could say we want this to start from line number seven, grid column start seven, and we want it to span and up to line number 13. So I say grid column end 13. And there's also a handy short notation for that grid column and grid row, uh, respectively. And this is the full code for that previous example. Now, like I said, line numbers are the most basic way of laying items on a grid, but they can be a bit cumbersome and hard to maintain if you ever make changes to your grid. So name lines are a bit more handy. Such as here, I want the content in the middle column, and then I want uh, one item to span the full width of, width of the page. So we continue as, as in our previous example, but now I've added names for the lines in between my track definitions. So I use angle brackets in between the tracks to give names for my lines, and they can be anything I want. And you can have multiple names per line for various purposes. So it's, you can think of them like CSS classes, but defined in CSS itself. So then placing items onto the grid works exactly the same as with using line numbers, but you use the names instead. And it's more flexible, because then if you go and add a line somewhere, you don't have to change the numbers again. But what's really cool is named uh, areas. So I can also do this. There's this handy definition for grid template areas where I draw a kind of ASCII map of our grid. Now let's look at that in more detail. Each row is delimited by quotation marks, and each cell of the grid uh, has a um, keyword to represent it. And those can be anything I want. So basically, this says that I've got a logo on the left, then I've got a navigation that spans two columns, then I've got content that spans 
two columns in the second row. I've got an aside which spans one column in the second row and then a footer which spans the whole of the third row. And when I want to place something into an area, I just say grid area logo and it goes there and that's that. Now why this is especially cool is when you make changes to your layout based on the size, the width of, of the container or whatever, all I need to do, uh, yes, this is the whole code for, for placing the elements onto the grid. So when I want to make responsive changes to the layout, all I need to do is redefine the grid and I don't need to, don't necessarily need to touch the items at all, which potentially makes my code much much more simple. So there's lots to know about defining grids and placing things on the grid, and I recommend you read the spec to find out more. So do we still need frameworks? Um, they've mostly served to hide the hackiness of CSS layout until now. And in my opinion, um, as a developer who has been using frameworks mostly out of convenience, I'd say that uh, going forward, they can only limit the potential of what we can do with Flexbox and CSS Grid and many other layout methods, uh, depending on the right use case. So we'll probably, we might need frameworks for, for some purposes, and there I can see, still see them as being useful for prototyping or people who, maybe back-end developers who don't have a clue about CSS and just want to get something a nice user interface quickly. But uh, if you are a front-end developer or someone who thinks you should know CSS, then I, I think you should put those frameworks behind you and, and start learning CSS layout deeply. Now, CSS Grid is not going to replace all these other layout methods. It's, it just means that now we can use floats and multi-column layout and flexbox and also display table for what they were originally meant to do. But what about old browsers? Browser support is actually pretty good. Uh, the implementation across modern browsers is amazingly stable. IE 10 and 11, however, uh, along with some old versions of Edge support an older version of the spec and it's missing quite a few of the properties of the new spec, so it will depend on the project you're working on, whether it, it's worth it to, to also write things in that older, to write code in that older spec. So that would depend on the project. I'd say most of the time, probably not. So just a quick example of, um, doing something with CSS Grid with a fallback. I want to create a gallery like this, and I want some of the images to span multiple columns and, or rows. I could start with an inline block style grid. Well, it's not really a grid. I'm just saying that I want these to be inline block and have a certain maximum width. And this should work in the oldest of browsers. And then I can enha enhance it with CSS Grid by defining, defining the grid and then adding a few additional styles to the elements I want to span multiple columns or rows. And in this example, I'm using auto placement, which is the default way CSS grid works. If you don't set a specific place for an item on the grid, it will just go to the next cell on the grid available, which is very handy for cases like this where you don't necessarily know how many items you have beforehand. There are some accessibility concerns with CSS Grid. So, as you can probably imagine, because you can place elements basically anywhere you want on the grid, uh, the visual layout of your page can quickly become out of sync from the source order of your page. And because CSS Grid doesn't change the tabbing order of your page, uh, 
people using just a keyboard to navigate can quickly become confused. So it's your responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. There are loads of resources for reading up on CSS Grid. Everything written by Rachel Andrew is, is superb. Uh, that's mostly how I learned CSS Grid myself. Her website, Grid by Example, is, is great. It's got loads of example patterns with full fallbacks for older browsers. The Mozilla documentation is, is great. I suggest you also read the spec. It's, uh, I was surprised myself how easy it was to read compared to some earlier experiences on, of reading uh, W3 specs. Jen Simmons has a great website with, with uh, some CSS Grid experiments. And uh, Rachel Andrew just came out with a book on A Book Apart, which is pretty short and really summarizes everything we can do today with, with CSS layout. And it's not only about CSS Grid. So I'm from the Zealand family. Have we got time for a couple of questions? Thank you. <laughs> OK, we have time for a few questions. Do we have one in the audience? Yeah. Uh, we have one here on the left-hand side. Um, yeah, you can shout it, and we'll repeat it for the stream. Yeah. Sorry, can you just read the microphone's yeah. right next Sorry. to you so I could repeat? Uh, I said you brought up the fallback mm -hmm. to compatibility issues with all the browsers. Uh, have you had to use any other fallback methods like JavaScript or anything, or have it always been able to solve it with, with uh, pure CSS? Well, to be honest, I'm, we're still in the process of using CSS Grid in production, so we haven't got anything that's been built from the ground up using CSS Grid live right now, but we are using it uh, on, on new sites. And I've used it to some extent on, to enhance sites we've maintained. But my approach would be not to do that. Um, if you have to, if your requirement is that the site needs to work the same in an older browser, then it might be a waste of time trying to do that and then to use CSS Grid. Because if you, um, and, and also it can be pretty hard to build a site using one of those frameworks I mentioned and then try to make it work with CSS Grid. Because uh, with CSS Grid, only the direct child descendants of the main container become grid items. Whereas if you're working with a framework, you probably have to create loads of wrapper elements. So my recommendation is that you start with what you need to, you start with good HTML and, yeah. and then do what you need to do for CSS Grid and then just make sure it looks good, uh, but not necessarily the same in old browsers. Yeah. Our ambition is to try to keep the separation more clean uh, going forward and having the DOM represent the information and the CSS, the layout. So that's really where we want to go. No wrappers. But um, uh, sorry, is it OK if I one more? Yeah. 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 Um, well, um, just if you can confirm if this is a good idea, is that uh, our way of thinking is, uh, and I think Rachel said the same thing, I think. so. Uh, is that we try to work from mobile first, and yeah. and then we do the layout from that, and any old browsers will more or less get the mobile version of of the site and or the layout mobile yeah. layout. I, I and think that hopefully that will work. But yeah. I was just gonna hear if you your thoughts on that. I think that that can work, but but I think it's in reality, I can't imagine being so extreme in, for example, the project I'm working on right now. So we're probably going to do sort of a little bit of enhancement with Flexbox and try to make, but, but no hacks, right? So we're just maybe going a little bit further than the mobile layout, but then doing the final enhancements with CSS Grid. Yep. Any other questions? 
Uh, actually, we're running out of time a bit. Okay. Uh, there will be a keynote. Uh, this is the last session that is specific for WordCamp uh, this year. Uh, we will have some closing remarks. So those of you who uh, haven't come from another track but going on the WordCamp track, please go uh, quickly up the stairs and to the right, to the bar five, where we'll do some closing remarks. And then in this room, there will be a keynote session 15 past. Uh, but first, a big round of applause for Daniel, and thank you for the talk. Thank you. Okay.